I don't know if I commented earlier that the Slido, actually, we do have a QR code that'll cycle between talks and during our break that you can take a snapshot with with your phone and submit questions that way. Um, so our next talk is from Dr. Pereja. Dr. Frisia Pereja is a breast pathologist and physician scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and she has an interest in genotypic and phenotypic correlations in breast cancer as well as the molecular under, underpinning of special histologic subtypes. Of course, one of those being invasive lobular cancer, and we're excited to hear her talk today. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, for, Megan, for the kind introduction. I am truly delighted to be here and present this uh, exciting topic. And I am really, really happy that pathology was just called the gold standard for lobular carcinoma, especially that coming from a radiologist. So thank you, Gary. Um, how do I pass the slide, sorry? Okay. Thank you. This is the outline for my talk. I will start discussing about the pathologic features and the genomic characteristics of this very special subtype of breast cancer, which is lobular carcinoma. Then I will discuss about the precursor of invasive lobular carcinoma, which is LCIS, or lobular carcinoma in situ, and the, me the mechanisms of progression from LCIS to invasive lobular disease. And then I will end this talk sharing with you recent work that we conducted developing an artificial intelligence-based model for the diagnosis of lobular breast cancer and how the application of this AI-based model help us learn novel biology. Breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. It's actually not one disease but a collection of entities. There are over 20 special histologic subtypes of breast cancer that are called rare or special, but are not so rare. Taken together, they constitute approximately a fifth of all breast cancers. And the recognition, their diagnosis has important clinical implications, given that they have a, a very distinctive behavior. Um, also, these special histologic subtypes are um, very characteristic um, under the microscope. There are some of them that we can diagnose without a microscope, just looking at the, looking at the glass slide. And several of these uh, special histologic subtypes of breast cancer, such as lobular breast cancer, have disease-defining or pathognomonic genetic alterations. So lobular breast cancer is the most frequent special histologic subtype of breast cancer. It was described at Memorial Sloan Kettering in the department where I work by Foot and Stewart in 1941. And lobular breast cancer, as I just mentioned, is very distinctive phenotypically. It's composed of two more cells that grow as single cells, shown um, here, and as, or as uh, single uh, cell files, and can show this uh, targetoid configuration that we can see on the upper right panel around normal structures. These cells are usually monomorphic, and the hallmark um, histologic feature of lobular carcinoma is its this cohesiveness. Invasive lobular carcinoma comes in different flavors. There are several subtypes of it. The most common is classic lobular carcinoma that we see in the um, top left. We have then alveolar breast cancer, which uh, grows in nests. We have trabecular breast cancer, trabecular lobular carcinoma. Then we have solid lobular carcinoma that grows solid sheets. We have mixed tumors that have regions that have a lobular phenotype combined with regions of a different morphology, most frequently ductal carcinoma. There are also pleomorphic lobular carcinomas that are composed of these very high-grade tumor cells, histiocytal lobular tumors that can be co uh, confused with um, histiocytes, actually, and they're very challenging to diagnose. And we have also signal ring uh, lobular carcinomas composed of these very peculiar signal ring-like cells. Um, this discohesiveness that is characteristic of lobular carcinoma is caused by deficiency in a protein called ecadirin. Ecadirin is encoded by the gene CDH1, which is located in the long arm of chromosome 16. 
And ecadirin is a protein, as it, as it was just mentioned, that plays key roles in the cell-to-cell -cell addition. And that's why it's a loss of function results in uh, cells that are very discohesive, that grow as single cells. Most lobular carcinomas are characterized by biallelic genetic inactivation of CDH1, as we and others have shown. And this biallelic inactivation of CDH1 can be caused by different mechanisms. Most frequently, by biallelic mutation, which is a um, somatic inactivating mutation associated with either loss of heterozygosity or the, of the wild type allele, or a second inactivating mutation in the other allele. It can also be caused by homozygous deletion of this gene or by epigenetic means in the, in, as promoter methylation of CDH1, which causes a reduced expression of this gene. Invasive lobular carcinomas constitute a strong genotypic-phenotypic correlation in breast cancer. They have this very peculiar phenotype that, has, that is caused by inactivation of CDH1, and biallelic inactivation of CDH1 genetically can be seen in approximately 80% of lobular breast cancers, while other non-lobular breast tumors um, harbor genetic inactivation of CDH1 very rarely, in less than 1% of cases. That's why this is a strong genotypic or phenotypic correlation that can potentially be exploited therapeutically. Given that it has been shown that the efficiency of CDH1 in tumor cells um, um, results in genetic vulnerabilities. For instance, exemplified as synthetic lethal interactions with other genes, such as ROS1 inhibition. Lobular carcinoma can be caused by inactivation of other genes um, that play key roles in the cell-to-cell -cell addition complex, not only e -cadirin. This is a more rare phenomenon, however. It has been shown, for example, in this very nice study, that lobular carcinoma can be underpinned by inactivation of catenin A. In uh, some recent work that we're hoping to publish soon, we had the opportunity, the unique opportunity, of studying a subset, a cohort of lobular carcinomas that had a very uh, typical lobular phenotype, a typical morphology, but that lacked genetic or epigenetic inactivation of CDH1. So we subjected this subset of lobular cancers to whole genome sequencing, seeking to detect uh, novel mechanisms underpinning lobular breast cancer. And this is one of the cases I would like to share with you. This was this uh, classic lobular carcinoma with focal alveolar areas, with complete loss of e adhering and P120 exp cytoplasmic expression, which is the uh, phenotype that is typical that we as pathologists use to diagnose lobular breast cancer. In terms of mutation, we didn't see any uh, mutation or copy number alteration affecting any gene of the cell-to-cell -cell addition complex. However, when we looked closer at the structural variants identified by whole genome sequencing in this case, we observed this fusion gene that resulted in the fusion of catenin D1, which is the gene encode, that encodes for P120, with this partner, then uh, D6A, which resulted in the loss of um, important regulatory regions of catenin D1. We concluded that this was likely uh, the molecular underpinning for this tumor, showing how there are other rarer uh, molecular ways of inactivate the cell-to-cell -cell addition operative in, no, in lobular breast cancer. Lobular breast cancers are uh, distinctive not only uh, histologically, also genetically and transcriptomically. Here on the left side, we can see how um, transcriptomically lobular carcinomas are enriched for luminal A tumors compared to other subtypes of breast cancer. At the copy number level, Lobular carcinomas have frequent uh, concurrent 1Q gain, 16Q losses. This, however, is not specific for lobular breast cancers, given that this is the hallmark alterations for uh, most ER positive uh, disease. In terms of mutation, however, they have a very peculiar uh, repertoire of somatic genetic alteration. Here in this heat map, this was a study uh, from Christine Desmet, we have the cases in uh, columns, the genes in rows, and the mutations color-coded according to the legend below. Um, 
besides CDH1 genetic alterations, lobular carcinoma has frequent uh, um, alterations in other genes, such as genes pertaining to the p kinase pathway, such as PIK3CA and P10. They have also uh, genetic alterations affecting certain transcription factors. This is very typical, very peculiar of lobular carcinomas, such as RONX1, TBX3, or FOXA1. And notably, they have fewer alterations affecting GATA3, which is a gene that is commonly mutated in other subtypes of breast cancer. Also, it's worth uh, mentioning that lobular carcinoma not unfrequently harbor um, hotspot mutations affecting the kinase domain of RB2 and RB3. And this is particularly enriched in special variants of lobular carcinomas, such as the pleomorphic variants. In a study that we conducted a couple of years ago, we sought to understand which are the repertoire of genetic alterations characterizing metastatic lobular carcinoma, and how metastatic lobular carcinomas differ genetically from primary tumors, which could uh, give us an idea which are the genetic forces driving metastasis in these very special tumors. So in these heat maps, we have um, cases in columns, genes in rows, on the right side, we have pleomorphic, um, sorry, we have primary invasive lobular carcinoma. In the left heat map, we have metastatic lobular carcinoma. And we see that compared to primary tumors, metastatic lobular tumors have an enrichment in P53 mutations. They have also a higher frequency of ESR1 genetic alterations that, as we know, uh, can cause endocrine resistance. They have also an increased frequency of genetic alterations affecting FAT1 that are associated with CDK4-6 resistance and uh, of biallelic inactivation of NF1, which is also causative of endocrine resistance. We also conducted um, this mutational signature analysis to understand which are the um, molecular forces, which mutagenic processes are active in metastatic lobular carcinomas. In, con in compared to primary tumors. In the inner donut, we have primary uh, lobular carcinomas. A subset of them have apobec, um, a dominant apobec mutational signature, but most of them have a clock or aging mutational signature. And in the outer donut, we can see metastatic lobular carcinomas, and what we can see compared to primary tumors is a significant enrichment in apobec mutagenesis, suggesting that apobec mutagenesis might be related to, to progression from primary to metastatic lobular breast cancer. Now I would like to switch gears and discuss a bit about lobular carcinoma in situ, which is a precursor of invasive lobular carcinoma. LCIS, or lobular carcinoma in situ, was also described by Foot and Stewart. This is a pre-invasive lesion. Can be most, in most cases, it's multicentric in approximately 85% of cases. In approximately half of cases, LCIS is bilateral, and oftentimes, most often, is an incidental finding. Importantly, LCIS is a non-obligate precursor of invasive lobular carcinoma. Some years ago, we had the opportunity to genetically characterize a cohort of lobular carcinoma in situ, a subset of which had a matching uh, invasive lobular carcinoma that had been concurrently diagnosed. So in this heat map, on the left side, we have LCIS, lobular carcinoma in situ. In the right side, we have the matching invasive lobular carcinoma. We have the uh, patients or cases in columns, and we have the genes in rows. Our first observation was that akin to invasive lobular carcinoma, LCIS in most cases showed um, the presence of CDH1 uh, by allelic mutations. And these were clonal, showing how CDH1 inactivation is the founding event of lobular neoplasia and is a very early phenomenon. And in terms of the repertoire of somatic alteration, we observed that genetically LCIS is very similar to invasive lobular carcinoma. It shares with invasive lobular carcinoma genetic alterations affecting uh, genes of the PI, of the PI, PI trikinase pathways, such as pic 3 ca and MAP3K1 has also frequent mutations in RB2, and has also frequent genetic alterations in these special transcription factors that are enriching lobular breast cancer, such as TBX3 and FOXA1. At the copy number level that we can see in the right side, LCIS and invasive lobular carcinoma are also quite similar. They share these uh, flat profiles with concurrent 1Q gains and 16Q losses. 
all together showing how LCIS resembles invisible oblique carcinoma at the genetic level. Uh, finally, I would like to end this talk sharing with you work we have conducted uh, to develop an artificial intelligence-based model that was trained on genomics for the detection of invasive lobular carcinoma. So I have been telling you that invasive lobular carcinoma is very special, is very peculiar. I have been telling you also how important it is to diagnose lobular carcinoma, but what I have not mentioned is how difficult it is to, to diagnose lobular carcinoma for clinicians, for radiologists, and also for pathologists. Indeed, the inter-observer variability is quite high, uh, as was exemplified in this very nice study here, where, where 35 pathologists from around the world were given a set of slides. Some were lobular carcinomas, some were not lobular carcinomas, and they were asked to give a diagnosis. So we have here the different pathologies in rows, and we have the different cases in columns. So there were cases like the ones in red or in blue that were consistently diagnosed as lobular or non-lobular by all pathologists. But then we see all these cases in the center, in the middle of this heat map, that had, were really very challenging, that some pathologists called lobular, some said non-lobular, some pathologists said, I don't know, some said, give me an ECA deering. So lobular carcinoma, not easy to diagnose. And the agreement, interobservable agreement, is not great. That's why it's, this is really a clinical unmet need. We really need a tool that can help us augment our capacity to, to diagnose lobular carcinoma. So, some years ago, we asked ourselves, can we exploit this genotypic, phenotypic correlation that we see in lobular carcinoma to come up with a genomics-driven, artificial intelligence-based method to diagnose lobular carcinoma? So this is what we did. We took this cohort of breast cancers that included lobular carcinomas and non-lobular carcinomas, for which we had digital images, and that had been previously subjected to targeted sequencing using MSK impact. So we had this uh, algorithm that we developed in collaboration, close collaboration with the industry. And we told the algorithm, these are the tumors that have a CDH1 mutation, and these are the tumors that do not have a CDH1 mutation. And this is how we train the algorithm. So algorithm now learn what CDH1 mutant tumors look like and what CDH1 wild type tumors look like. Please note that in, at no time during the development of this, uh, of this method, we use pathologic uh, labels or histologic images or pathologic reports. So being a pathologist, we completely try to bypass pathology using genomics to train this algorithm. And then we assess the performance of the AI model that we developed in two ways. We say, we ask ourselves, how well can this AI model detect CDH1 mutations? And how well can this AI model diagnose lobular carcinoma regardless of CDH1 status? So how was the performance of the AI model to detect CDH1 by allelic mutations? Really well. So, here we have the AUC curve of 0 0.96. We observed that our genomics trained AI model could detect CDH1 by allelic mutations with a sensitivity of approximately 80%, great specificity and fantastic accuracy and precision. We had, however, this subset of cases that we call our false positives, which were cases that according to our genomic data did not have biallelic um, mutations in CDH1, but that the algorithm had predicted to be CD CDH1 mutant. So we had a closer look at these cases and we conducted the reanalysis of the targeted sequencing that we had. And we also subjected these cases to CDH1 promoter methylation analysis using digital droplet PCR. And we saw that these false positives were actually composed of lobular, of lobular cases that did not have CDH1 biallelic mutations, but had inactivation of ecadirin through other molecular mechanisms, such as CDH1 homozygous deletion, or CDH1 promoter methylation, or some novel interesting uh, genetic alterations affecting CDH1, such as CDH1 introgenic deletion, which happened to be biallelic. It was associated with LOH. We also had the unique opportunity of studying a subset of these cases that lacked genetic or epigenetic inactivation of CDH1 using whole genome sequencing. 
This is one of these cases. On the left, we see that it has very typical lobular morphology. It grows uh, in a very discohesive manner. It has zero expression of e and it's very nicely detected by the algorithm. As we can see in the top, the areas marked in green are the areas that the algorithm calls a CDH1 mutated or lobular. So here on the right-hand side, we have a circus plot summarizing the whole genome sequencing uh, findings. From the outside to the inside, we have the chromosome ideogram, then we have mutations, then we have copy number alterations, and in the center, we have the structural variants. So initially, we were a bit disappointed because we didn't see much, but then we saw this uh, translocation between chromosome 13 and 16, so we got very excited because we saw, oh, CDH1 is located in chromosome 16, so perhaps there is some hope here. And we had a closer look at this translocation, and we saw that there was actually this fusion targeting CDH1 that resulted in the deletion of the first part of CDH1, including these very important regulatory regions, including the transcription start site of this gene, that of course result, resulted in no transcription of CDH1 and no expression of e -cadering. Showing how invasive lobular carcinoma is a convergent phenotype how, uh, caused by uh, molecular act inactivation of the same a family of genes, or of the same gene in this case. Our second question was, can this AI model that was trained on genetics diagnose lobular carcinoma regardless of its CDH1 genetic status? Yes, it can, and it does it really well. It uh, diagnosed ILC with an AUC of 0 0.98 and great metrics. There were, however, again, this uh, subset of cases that we call this time or false negatives, which were cases that the um, algorithm did not call lobular, did not diagnose a lobular carcinoma, but that, according to the pathology reports, were lobular tumors. So we had a closer look at these cases, and we saw something quite interesting, that these were mostly non-classic lobular tumors. Just a subset of these were classic lobular carcinomas, but most of them were ILC variants, such as mixed cases or pleomorphic cases. And we have here on the bottom right some examples. In panel E, we have this pleomorphic lobular carcinoma. In panel F, we have this um, solid lobular carcinoma that grows like a sheet of tumor cells. And in panels G and H, we have some mixed tumors. We have one area that is ductal and lobular, another area that is lobular in panel G, and in the final panel on the right-hand side, we have on the left the lobular carcinoma and the mucinous carcinoma that is mixed on the right-hand side. And in these two last cases, we see on the bottom um, panels how our algorithm was able to detect the lobular areas and did not detect the non-lobular areas on the same slide showing how this genomic strain AI-based algorithm can indeed diagnose lobular carcinoma robustly. In conclusion, lobular carcinomas uh, are, a really interest, are really interesting tumors. They are very distinctive and they constitute a strong genotypic-phenotypic correlation in breast cancer, given their discohesion, which is caused by inactivation of CDH1, lobular carcinoma in situ, or LCIS, which is the precursor lesion of lobular carcinoma, of invasive lobular carcinoma, is very similar to invasive tumors genetically. And I have discussed with you, and I have hopefully conveyed a message that I wanted to convey, that the integration of artificial intelligence and genomic can help us discover novel molecular mechanisms underpinning lobular breast cancer, and that the integration of these methodologies can help us develop new ways to diagnose lobular breast cancer. Thank you all for your attention, and if there is time, I will be delighted to take questions. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great talk. Um, in the interest of time, we are going to hold the questions. Um, if the guys in the back, the AV, can you put up the Slido QR code? Just so I think we haven't had the opportunity to kind of snapshot that with our phones. Um, that way, as the speakers are talking, if you have a question, um, you can submit that. And then at 11.25, for the rest of our presenters is when we'll kind of field those questions. So if you guys want to take a snapshot of that for the rest of the, the day, that would be great. And we'll put that up in between. 
Um, so next I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Rita McCart. Um, she 